Good afternoon. <laughs> I hope you all have been enjoying your time here at the Entrepreneur Summit, Black Enterprises Entrepre Entrepreneur Summit. Uh, my name is Dr. Nina Ellis Hervey. Uh, some people may know me from the vlog and blog Beautiful Brown Baby Doll, which is my brand. I'm also a licensed psychologist, a certified professional life coach, a licensed specialist in school psychology, and a nationally certified school psychologist and CEO. So I really love the initiative of this uh, Entrepreneur Summit. And today I'm excited because we are blessed with an amazing panel that is going to enlighten us on so much about the fashion industry, what they do, their businesses, how they run them, and all of those boss goals, right? All of those. So we have Kendall Reynolds, and she is the CEO and Design Director of Kendall Miles Designs. We also have Mr. Michael Wogu, and he is the owner of Embargo. And then we have Mrs. Vicki Sylvan, and she is creator and owner of the Shoe B. And so I'm gonna have each one of them introduce themselves talk a little bit about their business, and then we're gonna go from there and then open the questions up to you guys for discussion, okay? Hi, I'm Kendall Reynolds. I'm 23, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I started my business, Kendall Miles Designs, about two years ago from my college apartment. Uh, I went to USC in Los Angeles. And uh, my company is in the global business of luxury retail and we make shoes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Michael Wogu. I am the uh, founder, but I, also, I call myself the doer, the doer of Embargo. And Embargo is a, uh, a global travel, um, global charter travel goods. That's what we do. And we started after I finished college. Actually, it was my college uh, paper, my final. And I decided to start sourcing, uh, or trying to source, as I finished college. And then it uh, morphed into to what it is now, an accessory brand. So, and I'm from California, and that's it. Hello, I'm Vicki Sylvain, and I'm the creator and owner of the Shuby. Uh, the Shuby is an innovative and stylish clutch that addresses a problem that most women have in regards to when we wear heels and have to change into our flats. So it's a clutch that expands and transforms to fit women's heels. Um, as far as fashion is concerned, I kind of fell into it. Um, but it's, of course, we love, we always wear heels, so we know that it's something that we all go through. But um, I guess what I really wanted to speak on today was more so, yes, developing a product, bringing it to market, but also um, actually funding it, you know, having that stream as well, because when we think about fashion, we think about when we make things, and we're excited about that, but then we have to pay for it. <laughs> so it's like, how do we keep it going? Um, so there are a lot of pieces in, you know, that we, again, today, we'd like to, of course, address your questions that, um, in regards to how to keep the business going from concept and then bringing it to market. So my first question to them is going to be more geared towards how did your business start, okay? And also, what have you done since then? How are you sourcing? Who is your target audience and your brand towards? Those types of things. So if you could explain to the audience that so they could get a more of a feel of the questions they would like to ask, that would be great. So Kendall, we can start with you. So like I said, I started my company in college. So of course, I was very, you know, ignorant to really running and owning a business. So my, my company kind of just spurred out of a passion. Um, it actually stemmed from a really bad breakup and I was in a new city and I didn't have friends and I kind of decided to channel all that negative energy into something creative. And through that, I realized I had ideas for shoes and so I'm the designer at my company and so I do all the sketching, and that just really provided an outlet for me that worked. And uh, so I knew early, being who I am, that I wanted to design luxury shoes out of Italy uh, that were beautiful 
you know, really artistically designed and of the best quality. So that's what I did. Um, I started by sending my sketches out to some fashion houses just to kind of get a taste and to see, you know, where I kind of fell um, in terms of my design uh, capabilities. And it turned out my designs were like a big hit and they wanted to hire me. Uh, several wanted to hire me. Um, but it just, you know, as the negotiations kept going and I learned more about these companies, I realized that this was not the right fit for me. And if I wanted to do this, I was going to do it my way. So I started my own company. And I made connections. And they led me to Italy, where I met my agent, Karen. And because, you know, Italy is kind of, they're different. They don't like Americans. They don't want to work with Americans. They don't trust Americans. So you have to have an agent on the ground there to unlock the resources like factories, suppliers, and skilled craftsmen, uh, technicians, uh, you know, all of those types of components. So that's what I did. I found Karen. She's amazing. And uh, from there, we built collections. We're continuing to build collections. And I'm selling into stores. Wonderful, that is awesome. And when we, yes, round of applause. At such a young age, that is so awesome. And when we come back around after each person has talked about that journey, we're gonna talk about struggles too, because we heard Kendall say that she started when she was in college, so it's possible. Michael, could we have your background? Yes, okay. I. Uh... I think I started before I knew I was going to start. Why do I say that? Well, I fell in love with travel as a, a young kid. I liked it. We went to, my family would do uh, cross-country trips. I loved those, those trips. And um, I remember we went, we took our first international trip. I was in fifth grade. And uh, my sister and myself, we had our passport stolen in the airport. So we're, and my mom, we only got, we got on the plane because my mom had brought our, our birth certificates. So they let us back on the plane, but we had to go to the embassy in Rome to get new passports. So from there, I always, anytime I went somewhere, I said, I gotta make sure all my stuff is together and tight. Um, my fourth year, in college, that summer, I went to Costa Rica to learn Spanish. And while I was there, I was pickpocketed. Those two experiences made me get very, uh, very intentional about, by the, about the way I packed my, my things. And I didn't want it to look frumpy. I didn't want to look like a you know, like a frumpy traveler with a fanny pack. So I started, uh, I would draw, but I started using like duct tape and cardboard to put shapes together. And then I, I got excited and I said, I'm gonna do this. That was my, I was entering into my graduate program in school. And I started trying to source around Los Angeles, but I didn't know where to look. And uh, back then, there, there wasn't really the Alibaba, there wasn't really that, that sourcing tool. So I started looking, I started with shoe cobblers. I found that shoe cobblers made bags. So I started going all over Los Angeles. That took me to Leon, Mexico, which is the leather capital of Mexico. That took me to Brazil. Each place I would just get one little piece made. And then from there, I went to China. Ended up staying for two years got my first collection done, came back. And since then, I've been pushing, uh, pushing embargo. I took a detour, started a lot of private labels. So I did everything from uh, suits, to bags, to folios, to hats, and then almost lost my company to my partner, let it die out for a little bit. Like I didn't work on any of the 
the uh, marketing for about two years. He said, man, just take it. I took it, attached the site back to our account, and started the engine back up. So we're back, we're running. Uh, we just got in travel and leisure, so we're excited. And I've, I've, I've done that. <laughs> yes. Okay, Vicky. If you were to tell me the earlier part of 2014 that I would be in a bag business or fashion business, I'd be like, okay, you're lying. It's not going to happen. And it's just basically just, again, time and time again, just getting annoyed of seeing the same thing. And I said, okay, I need to actually take action. You can complain once, complain twice. Third time, you need to do something. So that's how the, sol the, pro the solution came to mind. I had a tailor that I used to make clothes for me. And I just went to him with the idea of what I wanted to do. And within five minutes, he just kind of concocted something was like, do you want this? Is, is this what you mean? And I'm like, yes. So of course, from there, I ran with it. Um, of course, taking time to test it to see which works, what doesn't work. The first, of course, the first sample wasn't exactly how I wanted it to be, but it was the prototype. And then from there, just seeing, uh, talking to different people, seeing what, how it works and how if they find it helpful or what the, you know, working with the functionality of the bag. Then it was the case, okay, now making changes based on their feedback. And then from there, we finalized a product and was able to move forward with it. Um, has it changed my life considerably? Yes. <laughs> like I said, I was more in the community development and you know, helping, of course, build individuals. But in a way, it ties together. It's keeping women resilient. Um, and keeping, of course, sophistication. Even if we have to take our shoes off, we, still have, we can still look good. Um, as far as the, you know, sourcing it, like I said, I did use my tailor. I still use my tailor. Um, when we have big orders, we hire someone else on who's basically per diem, who helps with the process. Um, initially, I wanted, I said, I wanted to be made in Haiti. You know, that, that's the goal. But then I know before you can actually move forward to source, you have to make sure the product is exactly where you want it to be, so that you don't have to worry about. Um, you know, are they doing it? Well, the quality control is not, of course, you still have to do quality control. However, you're still not tweaking the product. It's at its final where you want it to be. So we're close to that, but still we just need, of course, need to up our orders in order for us to be able to um, now say, okay, we're gonna go overseas to, to, place to, um, to place for production and manufacturing. But all in all, it's been a great journey. Of course, bumps along the way high <laughs> bumps, but it's just a case of um, being true to the product, but also creating the branding part of it and making sure that everything kind of ties in together. But um, that's basically the story of how it began um, and how it's where, where, we, of where we are right now as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. All of these are wonderful and amazing stories, and we've heard the successes, and we've also heard you all sneak in some of the lows that have occurred. And we know, as entrepreneurs here, that there are some lows. <laughs> There's money to be spent in money that you make, right? And sometimes there's some bumps that you hit as well and some plateaus. So I'm going to have each of you all maybe share two big struggles that you want to leave the audience with to focus on as things that they might encounter or things that they have that can kind of give them some, some guidance on what to do. So if there's two things that maybe you've seen happen or that has happened to you that you want to share with the audience that will educate them, that would be wonderful. So we're going to start with Kendall. First struggle for every entrepreneur, funding. It's the worst. <laughs> As a startup luxury business, people don't do that. And I understand why. It's very expensive. Very expensive. Italy alone, the labor costs in Italy, crazy. And then we're talking about the best quality leathers, furs, mink, fox, silverback fox. It's just really expensive. We're talking about beading. We're talking about Swarovski crystals. We're talking about gold, diamond dust effects, things that are just so beautiful. They're just so expensive. 
you know? If you're gonna start a luxury business, you have to be 100% confident that your funding is secured, or else you just have no chance. Costs come out of nowhere. Invoices come out of nowhere. <laughs> the only good thing about having a luxury business is you don't have to sell a lot to make a lot of money, okay? You know, my price point is about 500 to $2,000. So I make my money back, you know, fairly quickly. Uh, but in the beginning, it's very tough. And the second issue, a second struggle, again, in the luxury space, celebrity, who's wearing your product is everything. So that in and of itself is a struggle. Celebrities want everything for free too. So that sucks. <laughs> but I mean, with time, you overcome all of that if you stay persistent. In the beginning, funding was all I thought about. Two months ago, celebrities was all I thought about. You know, you just have to keep giving it time because you see results. You see them. As long as you're persistent and working really hard, you see them. And it's crazy because every day feels like, okay, whatever, this is gonna be the last day of my business because I don't have nothing but $5 in this account <laughs> and, and nowhere, and nowhere in sight is there my next sale. You know, every day for a while feels like that, but then you somehow you stick with it and you look up and everything is fine again. It's, there's nothing like it. And it's really hard to understand it if you haven't experienced it yourself. Because no words can really express the stress that you feel. And then when you get through that stress, no words can really express the joy that you then feel. So, that's So I think what we're hearing here is even though there were struggles that she mentioned, they always turn to triumphs if you stay focused. Yeah. Stay goal-oriented, stay focused. But also your strategy. It's, it's more so about the strategy than the amount of work that you do and how focused you are. Your strategy just has to be on point. And it has to, you have to continue to be updating your strategy and reworking it and learning from past strategies that didn't work or changing your habits. Like It's just really about staying in front of what's coming next. Awesome. Y'all take that home, please, please. Michael, what are your two struggles that I'm sure are gonna turn into triumphs? Well, Kendall hit them. She hit some heavy ones. I would say also, uh, one of the initial struggles that I think we'll go through is uh, analysis paralysis. We think, oh, I wanna do it and then you don't do it. And you think, ah, slow movement. Uh, thinking too much because I've seen this, I've experienced it. While thinking, someone else is slyly taking your picture of what you're wearing, what you're rocking, the way you're rocking it, and you don't even know it. And they're taking it to market. I've seen it happen. Um, while you're doing the studies um, to try to get funding, to show the, 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 the viability of your market, and you're you know, trying to study and say, okay, how big is the market? Someone else is studying you and copying you and bringing it to market quick. I've seen whole magazines that study black folk that are not written in English. I've seen it. And say, oh, uh, they're doing this, we should do this. And they just, they just study you, study us, and bring it to market quick. Uh, and even study the way we rock something, or the way we, you know, how we take the picture. So I think uh, that analysis paralysis, sometimes you gotta know, okay, instead of thinking, will this be fresh? Will, will people like it? Just do it because someone else is gonna look at you and they're gonna do it. Um, and then 
another problem after you start pivoting when something doesn't work because you never know uh, let's say you were making let's say you made an order and someone put something on wrong you checked everything you were there but you left one night and someone came and sewed something they did like an order of 200 wrong Sometimes you gotta pivot and get creative and say, oh, this is a custom release or something. You gotta be able to pivot because problems are gonna happen. Um, someone's gonna forget to, to, to put a lining in or, or even, even if it's made, I make my, I make, I source in China, but I also source here. Uh, even if it's made here, people can forget something. A machine can break. I was in, I was in Mexico bought a bunch of material. Um, I'm there to get him sewn by one of the top guys who sews. The guy the week before breaks his leg playing soccer, and he's the one that has to man the sewing machine. All my material that I buy, I can't use it. I have to leave it there. And I brought back only three bags. I was supposed to make 50 bags, brought back three. As Kendall was saying, you're going to feel like, ah, my business is going to crash. But you have to be resilient even in, once you start and then you hit a wall. You got to be resilient and keep going. So like I said, analysis paralysis, start it. Once you start, something happens wrong, be able to pivot and get creative and, you know, continue. Wonderful. Funding definitely. Um, yes. Funding definitely, um, as Kendall hit, is certainly an issue um, in, in any business. Um, but what I did find helpful was um, I was, is, was creating a business plan. Oftentimes we think that if you just have a, if you have a, you know, a formal business or you know, techno technology business, you, that's when you do a business plan. But even for fashion, it's helpful because again, it just gives you a guide of how to follow, of you know, what to do and what to do next. Um, now from that, I was able to obtain information to, be, to give me the confidence to speak about my business because now I knew my business from creating the business plan. Now, with, now from there, I was able to participate in different pitch competitions and that was be, be able to help infuse funds into the business. Honestly, at the beginning, I didn't think about, <laughs> I just thought I would sell bags and that's where money would come from. You know, I didn't think about, you know, oh, you need money to come from other areas, or you just need, you know, something to keep you afloat. Um, however, th those, par those par participating in the different um, competitions, but also, you know, getting money from, from family, friends and family, was able to help to help sustain and bring the business. And also the ideas that came to mind were not able to happen if I just relied on the sales alone. So that was helpful in regards to the funding piece. Um, so I continue to, to participate. And you know, to date, we've, I've um, earned, I have to say earned because you work for it, <laughs> you know, in regards to the, the funding, about $25,000 that I did not, would not have had if I did not participate in these different um, activities um, or events. Now, another piece is in regards to your target market. We're creating um, products either for men or for women, and we think every woman wants what we have. Every man wants what we have. It's just a given. Create it and they will come. You know, the whole marketing piece behind it, we don't really think too much about, and that comes into play, but also determining who your target market is, especially when you have luxury items. It's not for everybody, and you have to be okay that it's not for everybody. Or if someone looks at it and like, no, don't take it. Well, what do you mean no? <laughs> don't take it personal. It's just, it just may not be okay for them right now, which I found to be very beneficial because at times I did think, well, they're just walking away and they're not interested. But a year later, they're like, oh, I saw you somewhere. I just wasn't ready at the time, but I'm ready now. So all of these pieces come into play. So really don't discount any, anyone. However, determine who your target market is to ensure that you're able to market to them and able to really get the sales going, but also to market properly. Wonderful. That is a great, great input there. That's going to kind of spin my next question here, is that you talked about your target market. You talked about 
the people who supported you even in the beginning, even family. How did you build your target market saying, you know, my family has helped me here, others has helped me here, my sourcing has come from here. How did you determine who your target market would be? Kendall? So I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with my brand, but I have a very distinct brand identity. Uh, my shoes are very high stilettos. They are sexy and they are statement pieces. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're a little Beautiful. Crazy. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I knew off the bat that, you know, my product wasn't going to be for everybody. My shoes are made for a woman who is outspoken, longs for a disruption to her everyday routine. She's opinionated, she's well-researched, she's passionate about what she does, and she demands your attention as soon as she walks in the room. See, for me, it was a little bit easier to define because I am my own target consumer. But that's definitely something that a lot of brands struggle to define. And if you are able to put that into words, you're already a little bit ahead of the curve. And it's very helpful. And that's why you make a business plan. It's, it's essential. Uh, people who try to skip that step in starting a business, I just would never advise that. Excellent. Michael, could you let us know a little bit more about how you developed your target audience? Well, we were initially men. And, uh, you know, there's a, the model of uh, is it there or a necessity. So I kind of developed it out of necessity. And I said, okay, uh, what are the things that guys are carrying in their pockets? Phone, wallet, um, contrabands, uh, passports, or keys, um, bills, and so do do guys lose these things? I was on a trip with my with my friends. We were in Brazil. It was the school trip. One of my friends always mis was misplacing his stuff. When, when it's time for us to go, he's always looking for his stuff. I said, man, if I only had this bag available, he wouldn't be misplacing it. So, I made something that holds IDs, you know, passports, you know, contrabands, all the stuff. And I made it for the person who's on the go running and gunning, and I said, okay, there's, I know I need this. I saw other people who needed it. So I said, I'm going to stay. That's my guiding light. Uh, it has to have function, but it has to, uh, it can't look frumpy. It has to look good. So function and the style. And then by picking those, those pieces, and you start to, you start to research, okay, what, what stores would carry? Uh, what type of people would carry? Where would they carry it? Calif I'm from California. Los Angeles is a, is a tight one because it's not, a, it's not a, uh, a walking city. Okay, people in walking cities like this kind of stuff. Okay, let me see what they like. Let me see what kind of color. So by knowing what, you, what your target customer needs, you start to now figure out where, where are they at? What are they reading? What are they doing? You basically have to profile who they are. And so that's kind of how I did it. I, I said, okay, I need this. My friend needs this. I made them the prototypes. Oh, we were going fast now. No more waiting in the, in the looking you know, for stuff. And then after that, I tried to just, just reach out and unite to different people who I felt were on the go. And then I guess by the doing, you start to your focus becomes even tighter. You start saying, okay, I didn't, I didn't know that my target market, a big chunk of them are in Japan. I didn't know 
you know, until Japanese started hitting the website and buying. I said, oh, okay. So reading Japanese magazines, oh, these guys love these kind of bags. Okay, they like Americana bags. They like natural leather, they like handmade. So I started to, to learn. As you start doing, you start to, if you listen, you start learning. So what I'm hearing too is making sure that you have a tighter focus on your audience, you have to figure out and filter down to who that actually is, and that benefits your business. Yes, and sometimes you don't know you don't know where a big chunk of them are. You think, okay, they're gonna be here, but you don't know. Let's say you go to a trade show, and a bunch of people pass by the booth, mm -hmm. or see you and stop you and say, and you go, oh, this group is. All, I didn't know Japanese people liked this stuff, but they do, and they're a big, a big client. Wonderful. So, so collecting data, looking at analytics, looking at who's hitting your store, who's coming to these shows, all of that has to be collected. Okay. Vicki, what did you One think? of the things I, ch I had challenges with at the beginning was pricing. You know, again, I'm of the mindset of community, so everyone should have a shoe. Um, so my mentor, Alfred Evans Jr., he said something to me during a meeting that hit me so hard. He's like, you're not your customer yet. I was like, whoa, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, I, I made it, what do you mean? But it's the case of price-wise, it's something that it isn't for everyone and be okay with that, as I mentioned before. But I had to read a lot, a lot of, you know, in regards to who my customer is and what type of lifestyle she lives. and. And again, see like, okay, I can identify with that. So, little, so I am my customer now, thank you very much. <laughs> but um, it's a case of knowing where to go and what circles you should be in. Oftentimes, um, a lot of pop-up shops, a lot of events will come up and, oh, you should have a table there. You have to be very careful as to not um, be everywhere. Because again, like I said, not everywhere is for you. Um, and you might be wasting your $200 for the table, you know, or sometimes $50, sometimes $500. It varies, and that's costs that are going out the window that, you know, you could have, and then you, you don't get, you don't recoup the money back. So it's being very careful in regards to where your brand is and what's, what's, resp what's represented. So now I do know uh, women, you know, faith-based organizations that have empowerment conferences and women going to teas and, and, you know, people who are women who are, who are willing to spend, you know, who have the uh, disposable income to spend a little bit extra on themselves, who are very particular about their shoes, <clears throat> Ms. Kendall, um, you know, those who are very um, particular about their look on all of these things and, and making sure that I'm within those circles. I've learned now not to just say, oh, you have a table, cool, I'll do it. But now I will attend the event first. You know, that cost is a little bit minimal, sometimes even free, and you can see whether or not this, this will work, if, this, if that's the environment for you. Um, sometimes, like for instance, like um, expos, the costs are very high for the tables. I mean, there's a comma in there a lot of times, mm -hmm. and you don't have that, you know? So go to see whether or not, you know, people are stopping at the tables to, you know, to, to vet what you have. Because oftentimes people do go and they just walk by and they don't see you. And again, you leave there with no, with no funds. And it takes a lot of money to attend. First of all, you have the, the cost of the table or the cost of the booth, but then there's the cost of you getting there. So oftentimes you have to travel, maybe rent, if you don't have the vehicle or van, you have to rent something, get, then you have to get um, with props to make it look like a boutique when you're not a boutique because you're just mostly online. So there are a lot of costs that you have to put into consideration, but then is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And is your woman or your client or your Ava client avatar, your person, is she going to be there? If she's not, then you just wasted a lot of money and something that you cannot get back is your time. Priceless information. So even more, you're doing the legwork to figure out exactly what's going to work for you before you even attend with your items or with your business products. And that's Awesome advice. Thank you. Scoping out the scene first, because anybody can tell you anything about what's going to be there, but you see it firsthand. 
So I'm going to, from there, open questions up to our audience for some minutes, a few minutes here, and get you all to ask some questions of these wonderful panelists. <laughs> and the, I'm sorry, the microphones are here and here. Um, for Kindle, um, just how you went about, um, as far as like your designs, how you went about finding somebody to actually put your products into production so that you could have samples and stuff like that to be able to show to the fashion houses. Got you. Um, okay, your terminology a little is a little confusing. So how did I find a factory? to make my samples so that I could market those samples to boutiques. Okay. So like I said earlier, when you're doing your production in Italy, you have to have an agent. And your agent is someone who's been on the ground in Italy for some years, has relationships with factories, has relationships with specialty factories as well, like, you know, beading, like Indian beading, like, you know, like, do you know what that is? Like the little tiny beads. Mm -hmm. It's like that's another specialty skill. Sewing, like if you've seen like the new Gucci with the patchworks. Like these are all specialty factories that are in Italy. And your agent has relationships with all of them. Even beyond that, they have relationships with the heel factory, with the sole factory, outsoles, boxes, tags, you know on your shoes, and so, you know, that agent is really critical. So I don't know if you're particularly interested in starting a luxury business, um, because I'm sure it's different uh, for production outside of Italy, I just don't have any experience with that. But once you find that agent, you know, and they hook you up with a factory that best suits your sketches and your designs and kind of your brand aesthetic, um, the factory willingly makes your samples. And it's not cheap, it's maybe between, it's probably about 10,000 euro. Um, but that, that pales in comparison to the cost of production, you know, so they willingly make those for you with an understanding that you go and market these, these designs to boutiques and you get orders and you come back to them and place production. Wonderful. Our next question. She actually answered oh. my question. I'll, 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 I'll see if I can maybe go uh, approach it from a different angle. Um, what, what process did you go through to, to select the agent that you selected? So at one of the fashion houses that I interviewed at before starting my company that was interested in my initial sketches, I met their creative director. It's a brand called Thomas Wilde. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. It's a luxury brand, but they're British. Um, and they're more popular in Europe than they are here in the States. Um, so I met their creative director. And from the moment we met, like we just really hit it off. You know, He loved my designs. He was a fabulous designer. We just worked well together. And so in the beginning, I actually brought him on board because he had 20 plus years of experience working in Italy as well. But he had worked everywhere. He'd worked in China, Brazil, Argentina. But I cared about the fact that he worked in Italy. And through that, he gave me connections to agents in Italy. So I just, from there, you know, I went about choosing the one that I liked the best. Wonderful. Okay, we have a question here. Yeah, um, I'm Kendra Palmer McGowan, and I'm also a shoe designer. I own Artiste Custom Footwear, and I love Kendall, so I'm really excited about this. Um, it's really important that we understand as African Americans, there are not a lot of people that do shoes, specifically shoe designing. So take all of her words that she's saying very, very key, because it's really important, and people don't do their homework. But one of the questions I do want to ask is for all of you guys, is what... Um, Production opportunities are you guys looking for now in the U.S. specifically, and are you really starting to try to do manufacturing here in the States 
in, instead of doing um, production outside of the states. Vicki, did you want to start? Yes, I currently still do production here in the states. Um, as I said, when I first started, I thought to go overseas, but for now, we're still based here. Okay. Um, later on, even I think even later on, if I do decide to move and move production, I see it and more as a, a portion of production, not my entire line. That's just in my notion at this point, but it's still local here. Okay, go ahead. I do production out of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's tough because a lot of a lot of the uh, production has moved overseas. I, I initially did my production in, in first in Mexico, and then in China. And the way I did, I actually just went there and stayed there until it got done. But it's it's tough, you know. So, um, but I do it in Los Angeles now, and We've, we're building a workshop, so I've gotten um, a few guys who are very, very good at their craft. Um, one guy is a saddle maker. Um, so, I, right in men's fashion, worldwide, especially uh, the more unique it goes, people really like American made. Americana is a big theme in uh, the men's fashion game. So if you want to sell, let's say, if you're, if, you're, uh, if you're not making that many units, let's say you're making 200 and, let's say 400 and under per, you know, per design, I'd say States is good and I'd say, uh, I'm from Los Angeles, so I, I will always say Los Angeles is very good. Denim, most of the denim companies, stateside, they're made in Los Angeles, even Japanese brands, make their denim in Los Angeles. Um, leather, a lot of leather uh, is made in Los Angeles. People from, I have some friends. Did you guys see the um, Beyonce and her daughter when they dressed for uh, Halloween, salt and pepper? Okay, my friends made that fit. They buy a lot of their leather out of Los Angeles. So I say LA is a, is a good place to go. But you can make it anywhere, even Midwest. For me, never. I mean, Italy is so special because these factories where I'm working are, it's like a generational thing. It's a handcraft that has been passed down for hundreds of years. It's a special skill, it's a special technique, and it's unique to Italy. Wonderful. Hello. All right. Hi. Hello. Thank you all so much for your amazing knowledge. My name is Christian Agba. I am a publicist from San Antonio. Uh, most recently, and but I should say this, I'm a publicist in economic development and community uh, engagement. Uh, but most recently, I've been given the opportunity, thank you so much, Michael, to embark on a dream of mine. And I plan on doing my own PR. Uh, what kind of things do you, one, my question is, do you use a publicist? And two, what do you usually require from your publicist? Do you require celebrity endorsements or do you require uh, news and media features? What kind of things should I be looking forward to doing? Get the brand popping. <laughs> uh, no, I, I would say, well, you know, I would say, Give your PR, your publicist, a wish list and, it can, and go high. Give the top, top magazines, but I would say also top online magazines or blogs also. Before people would sleep on blogs, now blogs are at the front of the fashion shows. Give them all the top ones and uh, if you can, if you can hit with top blogs, top magazines, top influencers fast, you can sell your goods before you make them. You can get demand up. Let's say you, let's say you just use your last bit of money to make five pieces, took beautiful pictures, PR hits that, and so-and-so's rocking it. I, I told Kendall I saw Keisha wearing it. I like Power, the show Power. I know, I know, I'm just saying that because everyone else knows, you know. <laughs> but she was rocking the shoes. People see that. Stores, 
will place orders and they might place them faster than you going to a trade show. So if you can get those, you gotta guide the publicist to tell them who you want, you know, to be featured on or featured in. If you can get that and get the publicist to, to, publicist to say, okay, and it gets done, half the game is, a big part of the game is solved. Okay, I have to say that I disagree. Is this on with that a little bit? See, PR firms are big money, big money, a huge expense, and it's a pain in the ass. You shouldn't have to tell them anything. As soon as you sign the contract, your expectation should be up here if you're working with a top agency and you're paying top dollar. See, my, my PR firm, when I walk in their office, everyone gets their shit together. And they're like, Kendall is here. They know that they have to show me everything that I wanna see. And I'm not, I'm not gonna be there like, okay, I want you guys to target this and reach out to this person and pitch this and do this. If they can't come up with that on their own, cancel them. Because that's what you're paying them X thousand dollars a month to do. They're supposed to already have this industry knowledge. They're supposed to already be able to fit your product with these magazines, these blogs, these celebrities, these influencers. They're supposed to already know this. <laughs> your PR firm is in Japan. You have to tell them something. You're expanding into Shanghai. They speak Zhongguan, they speak Chinese. You have to give them some direction. If, if you don't give direction, it doesn't get done. That's what I think. I think that you're expanding into, into another country. You have to give them direction and tell them what the target is. That's, that's what I think. I think what I'm hearing here too is that it's gonna be what fits with you, your brand, your personality, and how much control you want over how your PR is gonna go. But I think we can all find that we can agree with both is that sometimes if I'm gonna pay top dollar, I expect for you to already know what to do. Whereas also, I might have some specific directions and instructions for you as well. That so that, yeah. You're you know, always, yeah you're always going to have you know, some specific changes that you're going to tailor to your brand vision because when you're the CEO, you're the one with the vision and people can't really see into your head and you have to sometimes reiterate. Mm -hmm. But I believe you, have your you have your requirements, definitely, um, and you have the bar. And you're spending that much money a month for services. It's a case of you should know you should do the, your due diligence and research as to which PR fits your business. You know, it's not just any, because at the very beginning, everyone's coming at, I can do this, I can do this for you, I can do this for you, and you go with the first person, and then you're like, oh no, you can't do it for me. But at this time, you're already in, in contract, you're already in, so it's, just, it's a very difficult situation. But I agree, you should know, you should be telling me and what direction you would be able to, to bring my, my, my business for you to, in order for you to get my business. Um, but as far as for myself, um, it's a lot of, because we, we don't have that budget line yet, you know, in <laughs> regards to um, a PR person, but I have been approached. And again, I still, I still, I'm at the stage now where I can say thank you, but no thank you. Again, it's knowing where your market is and knowing if they're really going to bring you and have the, you in mind in regards to your brand. And again, doing the diligence to know what they're able to really offer and if it's really gonna help you with sales. Because oftentimes you think about magazines, you're like, oh my gosh, that's where I wanna be. I, you have your dream magazines, but the conversion rate is nothing. nothing. Or they, they do find placements for you, but placements that you have to pay for. Mm -hmm. That's not what you want. I, well, mm -hmm. I don't want that. Okay. You know, I'd re rather be featured than to be, you know, have to pay for um, for ad and for a small space ad in the back of the magazine. That's you know, nice. so it's, it's it's right. So it's you have to be very careful because money is scarce at this point. And, and even when you money is flowing in, you still have to be careful as far as who you're giving your money to, mm -hmm. and that you're not being taken for a ride. 
And as for what you want from them, celebrity placements, features in magazines, interviews, articles like that. But you also want like desk sides, which is something that people don't really talk about much, but can be very impactful. Like I'm doing desk sides at like Vogue, W Magazine, L, and it's basically you just, it's really informal. You just kind of bring some products, some samples, you sit down with the editor and you guys talk, you know? And so that way they're kind of like, when the opportunity arises, like, okay, so let's say they're doing a story on new luxury shoe designers. They're gonna be like, oh yeah, remember that girl that we met with, you know, back two months ago? Like, it's, it's never immediate. But desk sides and brand partnerships. I actually just got a cool one. So, you know, like, they're supposed to be doing stuff like that and thinking outside of the box and finding other brands that you can partner with. Um, networking, you know, n not just staying in the lab and creating, 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 you have to get out there. You have to go to different events you, such as this and you network so people know what you're doing. And they, at this time, you can get, even get interviews while you're here. So that's marketing in itself as well. Um, but also they can connect, you know, and that's what you want. It's a case of, oh, I know this person can help you with, from this magazine, go to their functions, you know, participate. Even. Um, maybe if you have a, a piece that you're able to, you know, that you have disposable pieces that are, you know, that you have available to you, that you can actually be used for silent auction for a big event that you know your target market will be there. And again, that's free marketing right there. And then you have placement in their journals. So there are ways that you can work around it on the low, none to low budget. Um, but again, it's just being strategic and not wasting the time and money. And so it sounds like being well researched well prepared on top of yours, already having your connections and networking and knowing who fits best for brands and the brands that come into you, making sure that they're supported by the people you're reaching out to. That makes sense. So I wanna say thank you to our panelists. They have been awesome today. Awesome, and thank you to our audience for being attentive, asking questions. This is what we need. We all need to make sure we're feeding back into our businesses, especially businesses of color, okay? Uh, so let me reiterate that, especially us, okay? So thank you all for coming, and again, enjoy your rest of the rest of the summit. Thank you, thank you.